on November 4th, 2008. A good friend of mine, Steve and I, took a week's vacation from work uh, to go deer hunting in Mount Pleasant. And uh, we had a nice little place just uh, outside of town in Mount Pleasant. And Steve and I uh, like to hunt together. So he'll go to one tree and I'll go maybe 10, 20, 30, 50 yards uh, away from Steve where we can see each other and we can talk and we can kind of have fun. And, uh, and we hunt. So that particular morning was beautiful. It was very calm. It was really cold. And it, the sun was shining. It was just a great day. Uh, Steve and I had been up in our, our tree stands for, for, the mid, for the morning and uh, had several deer come by us. Uh, it was really Steve's first year of, of bow hunting and uh, we had a, a nice deer, a nice buck that uh, was starting to come down the trail to us. And right before that, Steve looked at me and, and this is kind of typical of Steve. And he had forgot, he said, I forgot my release. And release is the thing that you clip to the bow to, you know, to be able to shoot. And I, had, I didn't think anything of it because that's just Steve. It was kind of funny. We're kind of chuckling. And then the deer came down and, and you know, stood at about 10 yards from Steve. And we're looking at each other. And Steve takes a shot and shoots completely under the deer. And, and you know, if you know hunters, sometimes th that would be the end of the world for me. I'm like, I missed that deer. We were laughing hysterically because it was funny. Uh, we thought it was, uh, it was just great and uh, typical of Steve. So at that time frame, it was about 10 o'clock in the morning. We decided we would get down out of the tree stands that we were at and we'd move a little further into the timber and try to catch what we call midday movement for deer. Especially during um, the week of the rut, uh, deer like to move around a lot, uh, especially midday. So Steve and I went down to another ditch and uh, Steve got in his uh, climbing stand about uh, 40 yards here and I walked down to another spot where I could see Steve and got my climbing stand on, attached it to the tree and then shimmied up the tree. When I got to the top of the tree, uh, I was on a hill. So this way, looking out where I thought the deer would come from, which they never come where you think they're gonna come from, it was about 10, 10 feet up. Behind me was about 25 to 30 feet. Uh, and I had decided that I didn't really like how my tree stand was setting, I wanted to adjust it. I was just getting ready to attach my safety harness to that tree. And I decided I would wait as I adjusted my stand. So I took the top part of my stand, it's a two-piece climbing stand, and I unhooked the top, moved it, hooked it back, and then put my weight on it to move the bottom part with my feet. When I did that, it was apparent that I had not clipped the top part of my tree stand back onto the tree because it moved and came apart and it came apart just about that much. I just tell people my life changed with just a couple of inches. When that happened, it jerked me back and my back foot went off the back of my climbing tree stand and I fell backwards. And as I fell backwards, I went to grab the top part of the tree stand, which of course wasn't attached to the tree uh, and I fell. And I fell 28 feet, uh, landing on the back of my head. Uh, now, if you know, 30 foot fall is considered a death fall. So it's three stories, think about that. So when you're falling in the timber, not only do you have to worry about the height, but you also have to worry about what's on the ground because there's a lot of deadly things on the ground when you fall. Um, I fell, landed completely on the back of my head and my feet and my legs came up over my head with such force that it completely snapped my spinal cord in two. Uh, all but severed it um, and, and broke my back, obviously pretty severe. Um, I was knocked out for probably about 10 seconds. I wish I was knocked out for the whole time, but I came to fairly quickly. And immediately I knew that something was not right. Um, I kept just panicking and, I, and, I'm, touching my, and I'm touching my legs. I'm, something doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like I'm you know, touching my legs. Steve, my friend, I had just gotten down out of his tree stand to come running over to me and he says, Willie, you're fine. You just broke your legs. You're fine. And I told Steve, I said, no, Steve, I'm, I'm not fine. I'm not fine at all. I have, um, I've broken my back. Um, I said, something's wrong. You got to get, you got to get a, somebody here. I'm, I'm going to die. Um, not knowing really what happened. I thought, well, yeah, I mean, but I could tell something was severely wrong. I, I knew I was going to die. Well, we were smart enough to at least bring our cell phones with us. It seemed smart at that time, but um, you know, Steve and I kind of assessed the situation, um, and I was in excruciating pain. I mean, just pain that I've never obviously experienced before in my life. I told Steve, I said, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm dying. I grabbed my cell phone. Steve grabs my cell phone, and I dialed my wife at home. So that's one of those calls that you're getting. You're calling your wife, and honey, I love you. I fell out of my tree. I'm, I'm going to die. You know, I, I've loved the, the time that we've had together. Can you tell the kids I love them? Dustin, Riley, Carter, can you tell them how much I love them? You know, you're crying, you're panicking. Um, 
you know, it's, it's funny in those things, people think, you know, you're a guy, you're tough, you know, it's just not like that at all. You panic, you, um, you don't want to die. I don't want to die, nobody wants to die. But I thought I was, I thought I was dying. Um, so, you know, there's my wife getting a phone call that she still, you know, remembers to this day, obviously, of me telling her how much I love her and that, that I'm not going to be there at the end of the night I'm, and I'm going to die. So um, I hung up the phone with her because I really couldn't talk anymore. And uh, Steve then told me, he says, Willie, I've called 911. I have to go. I'm like, what do you mean you got to leave? You don't leave me here alone to die. He says, I have to. I've got to go find a place so that I can get the emergency personnel to come find you because we're in the middle of the timber. We're not just off the side of the road. So, so Steve left, and as he's walking away, and, and I always remember this, and, and, and people are like, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't tell this part of the story, but I always do, is, is again, I come back to think, you know, I'm a pretty independent person, I was pretty tough, you know, and, and people, you know, you see in the movies that someone's dying, and it's like, you know, you, you're strong, and it wasn't like that. When Steve started to leave, I, I just absolutely panicked. I started screaming out, help me, help me, please God, help me, um, you know, and crying, and I'm gonna die alone, and, it was very, you know, it was a very humbling moment, obviously, and I'm thinking, you know, this is it. I'm, I'm going to die. So um, I laid there uh, on my back and then rolled over to my, to my stomach, um, which caused a lot more excruciating pain. But, uh, and then laid there just trying to focus on, I guess, what I was going to do and how I was going to get out of this situation, um, trying to stay conscious with the best I can. About 20 minutes later, I could hear the emergency personnel coming through the timber, and, and they had found me. Uh, and talked to me and, you know, told me they were going to try to try to get me out of there, going to try to make me better and, and try to get me, you know, somewhere safe. And, uh, you know, at that point, most of those folks, a small town, I knew all those people. So one of the police officers was Dana, another was Mark. And, and I remember asking him at one point, I'm like, I said, Dana, did you bring your gun? And he's like, yeah, why, why would you ask me? That? I said, so I want you, it, I'm in so much pain and I just, I know I don't want, I just, can you just take your gun out? Can you just shoot me? No, no, we'll, we're not going to do that. We're going to get you out of here. We're going to get you out of here. And kind of gave me a little pep talk, and then, uh, you know, that's amazing. All of a sudden, I wanted to live. You know, it's like, all right, now I want to live. So, um, so then I got really scared, because then I heard the life flight come in. I heard the helicopter come in. Um, then I realized, well, I am in a lot of trouble here. This is going to be bad. Still to this day, I can't handle a helicopter when I hear it. Um, it's, uh, it just brings back bad memories. But they picked me up, put me in a gurney, and took me about um, 400 yards through the timber. Uh, to get me to an open field where the uh, helicopter had landed. So we flew uh, up to Iowa City, keeping in mind I'd already called my wife and already told her what was going on. So they were waiting there for me when I came off of the, uh, off of the helicopter. I remember it was my wife and uh, my in-laws and then, and then another friend. And, um, you know, they were there. My wife came over and, and I was still, you know, I still, I did want to live, but I was still not sure what was going to go on. So I was still really in bad spirits. And I remember she came over and she kind of leaned down to the gurney, you know, and, and said a few things that, that I'll never repeat, repeat just because it's just something that's between her and I, but, um, you know, and, and it really helped. And, and I went in for about a seven hour surgery. Uh, keeping in mind, doctors are, are they're, they're realists. They're pretty blunt. You know, I remember saying, am I ever gonna walk again? No, I mean, it's just that simple. No, you're not. You know, you're, you nearly severed your spinal cord. So. Uh, bad or good? I, I don't know. Uh, frankly, I think it's good because you get on with your life at that point. Um, you know, I, I just said, okay, let, let's, get, let's get this done. Let's get it through it so I can get back to my life um, and back to the people that I care for. Uh, so I went through that surgery, came out, and, and to make a long story short on that side, then you go into rehab. So it's an interesting thing about rehab is I don't know what I'm going to rehab for. I mean, I, I really don't understand what I'm going to rehab. What, what are we doing? Well, we're going to teach me everything that you don't know how to do now. I'm like, well, I know how to do everything. You know, they know, no, you don't. You don't get it. So uh, it was, I didn't know how to, they got me on a table, laid me down on a table and said, we're going to teach you how to roll over. And I'm thinking, yeah, what are you talking about? And I could not roll over. And it just hit me. You know, I'm like, oh, this, is, this is terrible. I couldn't, you, I couldn't roll over. I couldn't sit up on my own. I couldn't get into anything on my own. I had nurses in and out of my room. The folks that, that do it, the occupational therapists, the physical therapists, these were little girls. I mean, they're little gals. I mean, they're like this big. And they are mean and as nasty as you're ever going to find anybody. And I mean that in the most awesome way in the world. And they just kick your butt. Um, get out of bed. Wake up. Let's go. You can do this. Come on. You can, you can handle it. When I cried, they cried. When you, you know, when you'd have a hard day, they'd have a hard day. But they never let you quit. They never let you stop. 
you know, and, and, uh, and they would encourage it. So I went through that. I had to learn how to sit up. I had to learn how to roll over. I had to learn how to get in a chair, get out of a chair. I mean, just things you just don't think about. Because you got to remember, just like seven, eight, ten days before that, I was able-bodied. I mean, I, I did everything on my own. I mean, I just, and, and it was just a matter of inches. I mean, I, I used to sit up and I, and my wife and I would cry when we talked in the room. And I'd tell you, I was just, I was just hunting. So, you know, I was just hunting. How did this happen? I was just hunting. And, and uh, um, she would usually just tell me to quit being a baby. And uh, she's a tough gal. She has to be to be married to me. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, I, I wasn't ready for that. So um, I went through about three months of rehab and, and, you know, things like that made me a lot better, obviously. It went back to work. Um, at the time, I was store director at the Mount Pleasant hy at that time, and, and I wanted to get back to work. So three months after rehab, somewhere around January, February, still going back part-time work. Went in two or three days a day. And, you know, it was interesting because I had to rethink everything there also. How do I check? How do I sack? How do I, you know, what, what do people think? You know, those kind of things. And really wasn't that big of a deal. I was a lot faster because you can't keep up with me. I'm on two wheels. I can fly around that store like there's no tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Yes, I've run over a few people. Uh, that happens. That happens. It does. But uh, I also realized I was a very good two-wheeler. You know, you've seen the two-wheelers in the grocery stores. You put boxes on them. Well, they just set boxes on me. Somebody would kind of push me from behind. We'd go drop some stuff in the aisles, and then we'd stock. So uh, that's just the way it was. So really, at that point, once I entered back, I kind of entered in to that life, you know, of a person with a disability. And, and I'd ask you just to take a few minutes, a few seconds, and ask yourself what your opinion or your perception of someone with a disability is. And be, and be honest, be honest with yourself. Because I was, before my accident, I had my opinion, and I don't know that it was a good opinion, um, necessarily, for whatever reason. Um, but you know what, that perception is probably wrong, and I know the perception for me was wrong. And it's changed, it's changed a lot. We are independent, and we are more than our disability, and we're more than just that guy in the wheelchair. Okay, so that's what I've become to a certain extent. And that guy in the wheelchair, you know, the guy in the wheelchair, you know, the guy at Hy-Vee that runs, you know, the hy in a wheelchair, you know, the guy that coaches that team, he's that team, you know, from Mount Pleasant, they have a guy in the wheelchair. And that's, that's what it is. That's pretty much what it is. Um, I don't like that, but it is what it is. Uh, I also talk at, at uh, several hunter safety courses. You think, well, yeah, you're a real good example of hunter safety. <laughs> but I'm kind of the, I tell you what not to do kind of deal. But I always tell the group, I'm like, I don't like doing this because I'm that guy. That's the guy that fell out of the tree stand. That's the guy. And there's a lot more to me. And there's a lot more to another person that is in a wheelchair. There's a lot more to another person that maybe has a different kind of disability, whether it's physical or non-physical. It doesn't really matter. There's a lot more to that person than that. And there's no reason to be scared of them either. So I always look at it by the time I get to work at 7. I've already been through more than most people have, you know, for that day. Uh, and I think peace, people with disability have so many things to offer on that side of it because they're mentally strong, mentally tough. I mean, I think it's just nothing, nothing short of amazing. I mean, you have amazing determination, mental toughness, resilience, and drive. You know, and that's just what it takes to get out of bed in the morning. I've talked to people uh, all over the place that have disabilities. I was talking to someone last night who has a son. You know, we, we discussed it. I still go places sometimes where someone will look at my wife and ask, well, what does he want to eat? You know, um, that happens every once in a while, you know, uh, it, which, is, which is funny. I don't, I don't let it bother me so much as, as I used to, but I'll give you another analogy, too. So we discussed last night also about a door. So, so when I'm going somewhere and I see somebody and they open the door for me, here's my response in my mind. I'm like, hey, thank you. I think, oh, you don't think I get the door just because I'm a wheelchair? I can't get the door? What are you talking about? That's ridiculous. I get the door. Then guess what? If they don't get the door, I'm like, geez, you can't get the door for a guy in a wheelchair. <laughs> What's the deal? Why would you do that? You know? Uh, and, it's, and it's funny. I mean, it's funny because it'll get me all riled up and get me, get me whatever. And you get a lot of stares. You do. You get a lot of stares. And I talked to the Youth Leadership Foundation, which is a bunch of high school kids and college kids. And, and they're with disabilities, mental, physical, whatever it happens to be. And I explained to them that once you really realize what they're looking at, it's not really as bad. I mean, some people look and it's not a good look. And those people, you just like, go, what are you looking at? And they just freak out. Oh, no. But most people you look at, they're looking at something. They're looking at my wheelchair. Most of the time, they're looking at my wheelchair. It's fascinating to them. It is pretty neat. I hate it. But we kind of got a good relationship. I mean, you know, we, we, we kind of try to take care of each other. But that's a lot of times what they're looking at. I have a truck. And it's, it's got an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, lift on it where both the doors go out. And it's a spectacle. In fact, it's such a spectacle that when my kids are with me and I start to hit the button, 
my daughter would go, because everybody would start looking, you know. And uh, I, don't, I would not let that bother me, because it is, it's cool, it's something you never see it before. What is it? Well, there's a chance, you know, for some education. What is it? Where did that come from? What's it, what's it all about? Hey, this, how do you drive? I drive with my hands, here's how it works. I mean, it's just, there's so many incredible opportunities um, on that side of it. Um, but, it's, but it's interesting how those, those perceptions go. And I'll give you an example, just kind of the, a day in the life um, to close. And, and I, what I've got is a top 10 list. I went to the doctor one time. Uh, and again, that's a person. I don't go to the doctor all the time. In fact, my doctor is, hounds me all the time. You need to come in and see me once in a while. You need to come and say, I'm busy, doc. I don't want to come in there. You know, just, you know, I just don't want to come in. So, uh, but this is my top 10, 10 list. I went to a, a place uh, and, uh, for, the doc, for a doctor's point. And within about 10 minutes, it must have just been the day. But I mean, I had just a million people you know, saying things. And, and I kind of did a top 10 list. But, but number 10, while I was there, was you better slow down. You're going to get a speeding ticket. I heard that three times, three times that day. Um, number, number nine, so how long have you been crippled? Crippled, oh, that's a new one, not, not very long, you know. Sure wish I could drive around one of those things all day long. Hey, be my guest, be my guest. Um, bless your heart, you poor thing, hear that. Number six is, how did you get here? I mean, I'm like, I drove. Is that safe, you drive, you drive? Yeah, yeah, I can drive. Um, Number five is, I have a friend in Arkansas in a wheelchair. Maybe you know him. <laughs> you ever hear that? Yep. I know everybody in the country in a wheelchair. Everybody. So number four, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Nothing. I just do this for the good parking. <laughs> good seats. <laughs> number three, do you need help out to your car? Well, how the heck do you think I got in here? <laughs> Not that I said. Some of these I did say to those folks, but some I didn't, obviously. But... Uh, Number two was one of my favorite ones. It wasn't number one, but it was number, num number two. It was good. Did you come in that big, out, big bus out front with the rest of the wheelchair folk? No, nope, I didn't necessarily. I didn't see a big bus out there. And, and number one, I get this often, but it, it's great to see you out and about. I, yeah, yeah, you know, the home that they keep me at, somebody left the cage open and I got out. <laughs> but they're looking for me. Thank you. Have a great day.